Um, and the focus will be on, on non-local effects. So this is a work done in collaboration mainly with these guys. Um, and and a, I will discuss uh, several projects, but also there have been a number of, or a large number of nice discussions with, with these people here. Uh, here's an outline. I will start with a, a short introduction, just sort of motivating the talk. It's based on, on the main puzzles currently existing for iron selenium. Then I will move on to uh, discuss the issue of band normalization, a particular kind of band normalization and show that it doesn't work for iron selenium. And then I move to the main part of the talk, which is a possible microscopic origin of this red blue shift in small pockets. And then I move into the low temperature phase and discuss the origin of this missing Y pocket. And, and to get this, we need to study nematicity. And uh, we will show, I will show how interorbital nematicity might be important for this material. I hope time allows, but then we'll get to some orbital selective superconductivity uh, here in the end. The three papers that are relevant for this talk are listed here in black. And uh, background material. Well, there are other many other talks in this uh, conference series. Uh, we just heard Lucas, so there's a lot of background material there, but also we wrote this recent review paper, which is on iron selenium and its close cousins. Okay, so we're fascinated by iron selenium because it's a, a very flexible material. Uh, you can tune TC and uh, the system goes superconducting super from this pneumatic phase. We still don't know what is actually the detailed nature of this pneumatic phase. Another fascinating aspect that has been known for a while and which uh, is a topic of a lot of research is what is the origin of this very, very strong band realization? What comes out of DFT, DFT is not just DFT, as Luca has just told us, there are many different versions of it, but the standard one that's in the literature is way too large pockets, also a too large number of pockets and strong realization to what's measured in the actual low temperature pneumatic phase. A recent work by some of the organizers of this conference series has also shown that actually, uh, there, so there is a large uh, pneumatic splitting so a large difference in the RPS spectra if you go this way or this way. But actually there's a gap opening up out around the, the Y point, uh, deep in the nematic state, which opens a gap and maybe even lifts this pocket above the firm surface. So this is what we refer to as the no Y pocket or the missing Y pocket. The nematic energy scale is large. So it's of order, let's say 50 millivolts. And since these pockets, the Fermi energies are even smaller than that size too, it's not really possible to discuss the very low temperature band structure, low energy band structure in the Fermi surface without talking also about nematicity. So in that sense, strong band realization and nematicity are intertwined to, to get to the final uh, low temperature um, uh, band structure and Fermi surface. Okay, so this is in a nutshell the question, as I said, how do we get from here to here? And to answer this question, I will address the questions of strong band realization and the nature of the pneumatic state. Of course, we're not the first to address this at all. Uh, this is by far not a complete list. Here's the paper that Luca was discussing. Uh, for more details of various techniques and so on. I can refer you now to, to Luca's presentation, but also some of the review papers here. Lots and lots of works. It was since the very beginning of these materials have been dedicated to obtain better uh, models that incorporates strong correlations and, and the feedback on, on the band structure. But what I'll focus on is a particular couple of versions of that, um, as we'll see in, in a little bit. The second part of, of the, the second large uh, motivating aspect of studying this material is this very unusual superconducting gap structure. So the pockets are very, very small. This is the whole pocket, and here's the electron pocket. But even though they're so small, the gap and isotropy is very large around these very small pockets. That's very strange. And we've been fascinated for a while about 
how do we explain this gap structure? And there are some new developments um, sort of uh, comes, coming about because it, there is no, apparently no electron pocket there. So the picture is, is changing a little bit. But more generally, uh, there's of course the current very fascinating question of what is actually the nature of the superannuating state that emerges out of such a, a correlated metal, could be a Hunt's metal, could be a pneumatic Hunt's metal. I think that's an unsolved question. Okay, so let me go to the, the second uh, little part of this uh, presentation. So um, there was many, uh, as I said, many uh, proposals for band renormalization in these multiband systems. One of the ones I want to bring attention to is, is an early one by Potency now, but they just pointed out that if you have some mode coupling between hole and electron bands, it quite naturally will, will lead to a pocket shrinking. Okay. But um, since we have so many more experimental details uh, nowadays, it's, it's worth revisiting this uh, mechanism, not in, in toy models, but actually in sort of more material specific way and see quantitatively how much of this effect is actually out there. So we tried to just revisit this by including realistic uh, band structures, correlations, and then you calculate the self-energy in one shot calculation by including these, these kind of diagrams, typically relevant if you have strong spin fluctuations. And, um, and this is not the main part of my talk. I'll just show you the results of doing such a calculation for 11.11, LIFAS, and Einstein-Linium is that, yes, there is such a pocket shrinking. It's The mechanism is there. You can compare the bare bands and the and, uh, and the renormalized ones in yellow. This is just the spectral function calculated here. So these are generally a shrinking, but the whole point of what I'm saying is, is that for Einstein-Linium, this doesn't work. This mechanism is not capable, as far as we can see at all, of getting the right pockets, the number of the pockets and the size of the pockets. So what has been known then for a while also, started as far as I know from this paper, is that non-local correlations do this quite naturally. So for example, if you just include nearest neighbor Coulomb repulsion, we focus on this side first, mean field decoupling immediately leads to pocket shrinking. And I'll go through this in, in actually quite great detail in a few slides from now, how does this happen? But just straightforwardly, you get very small pockets and you can get these kind of propellers for Hanselinium doing the same thing for LIFAS generates it just, this is not a you know, generic result. It depends very much, of course, on the starting band structure. And now, of course, we start entering discussion of whether these uh, longer range coulomb deposits are really larger in this material in Einstein than other materials. One might speculate that uh, spacing layers leads to less screening and so on. I think this is unknown, but there are actually some you know, calculations, calculations pointing to, to, to that effect. Oh yeah, and this was just to point out that we used this mechanism um, to, from ab initio, we calculated the, the pressure dependence of these interaction parameters to, uh, to try to or come up with a possible explanation for this phase diagram of how magnetism, superconductivity, and magnetism uh, changes with, with pressure. <clears throat> Side remark. Okay, let me get to the main part of my uh, presentation. And so now we will just focus on what are the effects of longer range interaction on band structure. Okay, there are obviously very strong uh, band squeezing, strong coupling effects from Kuntz coupling and, and U and prime. But for now, I will ignore them and just see what is it that the nearest neighbor coulomb repulsion does. So we start from a realistic band structure and ion selenium, and we add this coupling. There will also be spinoff coupling. And in, in, for this, in this particular talk, I will only include the l sectors. Now, ion selenium is a material that belongs in the space group of P4 NMN. That is a non-symorphic space group. So some of these uh, elements, the symmetry elements, include small translation. And the real physical unit cell is actually two ion unit cell. However, for convenience, uh, it's often much easier at least calculation of wise to address the problem in the one ion unit cell. In doing that, the, so the right 
factor group is lowered to the subgroup, and the correct, correct subgroup is actually D2D, not D48, it's D2D, uh, because um, the, the right uh, sort of downfolded uh, band structure knows about the arsenic being above and below the planes. So the group elements are see you know, some uh, 180 degree rotations and neuro, and then it's not the C4 rotation that's in this element, it's S4. Okay, so the Hamiltonian of the one in the one and ring cell is only invariant under these symmetry operations. So if we discuss and study the effects of nematicity arising from the flavor coulomb, it really means breaking up S4 symmetry. Okay. Anyway, that's a bit technical, but uh, not extremely important. I will now uh, start with this band structure that was generated for iron selenium in this old paper. And then we will simply check what are the effects of nearest neighbor coulomb, both in generating band renormalization and nematism. Okay, this is the most technical slide. I apologize, but we have to go through a few, few things in order to understand the results that come out of it. It's not complicated. We just simply take the nearest neighbor coulomb, define, we mean field to couple it. So here's my, here are my mean fields. And this is straight, straight on the mean field. And I have a form factor, which my nearest neighbor is just cosine kx plus cosine ky. Now, in line with what was done previously, it's convenient to define a symmetrized version of this field. So this is just an averaged field over these uh, S4. You can think of these as C4 rotations. This is the matrix representation in orbital space of S4. And simply average over them. So this is explicitly symmetric mean field quantity. And the rest is just going to be a symmetry breaking point. This will not signify. Now, I will additionally write these fields in these basis functions of D2D. And these will just be formed in factors like this. So FS looks like this, and FD is of this form. Okay, so the final mean field Hamiltonian uh, resulting from, from decoupling just the nearest neighbor Coulomb has this form in terms of these two fields. You'll notice there's an alpha in here. I will allow myself to play with alpha. And the philosophy behind that is the same as in the earlier works that these are belong to different symmetry classes. So in a certain, in an RG sense, they might flow differently. And, and so uh, even though strictly speaking, the bare decoupling alpha should be one, we will allow it to be different from one. Other than that, we just run code, start with the five band model and uh, unrestricted and calculate these new fields. And here are the results. So this is just focus first on the band normalizing part. This is a matrix in, in the S way channel and here in the in the D channel. Okay, so this shows you which orbital components contribute to these mean fields. And the first part to notice is the diagonal elements in the S channel. And over here we have also some 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 structure. So let's see what this does to the bare band structure. Focusing first on the S components. You see that the dx set and the y set will be renormalized down. So this means the whole pockets at the gamma point will, oops, will be renormalized down. It shrinks the whole pockets, the gamma point. However, the opposite sign at the, in the xy orbital here, is, you might think this is renormalized up, but, it, but the form factor changes the sign out of pi pi. So that's actually also renormalized down. So this is exactly why the pockets shrink in this case. In the d-wave case, in, the, in, this, in this particular channel, we have the opposite sign of the x and the y point, but the form facts also change the sign exactly at those points. So then these, these, the electron pockets are shifted up. Okay, so this is was known, I'm just spending a little bit of time explaining why the pocket shrink arising from nearest neighbor Coulomb is in this effect we immediately get. Now, if you ask me why these results come about here, I can't tell you that. That is a feature of these models. This is not particular, and this is sort of generic. It's not that we change parameters and we get completely other elements. It's the numbers that change, but not the structure of this. Okay, by the way, uh, this is exactly why you get peanuts. It's, it's, re it's related to this factor here, because if you're shifting up only, say, the green part or the red part of these pockets, then you're, you're squeezing only along the side, and that's why you're not you you immediately get a peanut shaped electron pockets. Okay, going to uh, further, or, or looking now in the symmetry 
breaking channel, there is no S, S component, but there is a D component. And there's a lot of structure here. So this is nematicity arising from the nearest neighbor coulomb in a realistic five orders of model. It's in the D channel here. And what you see is, first of all, there's a, an asymmetry now. These have the opposite of the same sign, but the form factor is then giving them a sign change. So there's a small shifting up and down of the electron products arising from nematicity. Um, however, the largest component is this intraorbital component connecting X, Z, and X, and Y. Okay? There will be another domain where it's X, Z, and, and Y, Z. But this is exactly what causes this, or what, what leads to this uh, gap out here. So that it hybridizes these two bands. And if this, if this is large enough, it can actually lift this pocket above. With it. But quite generically, this intraorbital component is the largest component that we find. So that's why you, even if you start, that's why you, why you can end up with this kind of band structure with smaller pockets and a, a gap at one of them. And, uh, and that's how you from purely nearest neighbor coulomb repulsion quite easily get a, a scenario where starting the T's band structure has changed into something that looks quite like what's seen in ion selenium. At this point, I should uh, refer you to a number of other papers. For example, the fact that there's int intraorbital DXY nematicity, this has been discussed quite a bit recently in these works. And um, also there's another mechanism for, for, for obtaining this missing or no Y pocket scenario actually coming from that component as you can see in this paper by Ely Yerman and Luke Rhodes and, and collaborators. And, and by the way, in, in this paper, it's also nicely, uh, there's a nice discussion of connection to other experiments, how to explain quantum oscillations and so on and so forth. Um, so it seems to me that this is qualitatively in agreement with the recent developments of ARPIS, that there's a missing electron pocket that have this peanut shaped pocket here and only a small uh, hole pocket around the, the gamma point. Um, we can discuss the quantitative aspects, of course, like how big are these gaps and how big are the numbers that you need to put in here. In my opinion, that is a discussion that doesn't really make a lot of sense at this point because we did not include initial squeezing from U and J. You know, all these numbers will depend on the initial band structure. And as it was explained in earlier talks, the initial dispersion is way too large. Okay. So all these effects should be built on top of probably a much renormalized band already from, from U and J. But uh, what I do want to say is that the, the sort of symmetry analysis I did of my mean fields is not really a proper one. You know, what, what I did, I did a rotated one, the sort of symmetrized one, and then a non, then the rest. But well, what is the rest really? So what we should really do is we should just take our uh, calculated mean fields and decouple them in these irreducible representations that's allowed in D2D, right? And we did that too. And as we cool down, we see something interesting. There's actually two transitions happening here. The first is transition into the B1G channel. At a lower temperature, there's a transition into this, uh, we call it the EX, EX channel. So it's a part of this two-dimensional representation. One of the components uh, gets, gets uh, condensed and, and breaks, breaks this here. So now there's a number of, uh, red alarm bells and uh, open questions coming up. Uh, by, oh, by, before we discuss that, I should I would point out a, a re very recent work. This is a, a DFT work also with hybrid functional as far as I know, uh, um, where they actually find also, a, also we point out the fact that there's a, a only, only a one electron pocket coming out of interorbital nematicity. But I believe their um, structure is, is different from ours. Um, I don't know exactly where theirs comes from in great detail, but sort of superficially, it's very similar. It's a condensed pneumatic intraorbital uh, component in this in a, in a two dimensional representation. Now, of course, if you have this, there are a number of issues. 
you should see a double transition, which I don't think is seen. Then, of course, they could be accidentally close to each other, or they might couple weakly to the lattice or to probes. That's one thing. Personally, I think more that what we have learned and what might be, um, be uh, relevant here is that the ion selenium is very soft and it might, it's full of these microstructure components. This was studied in some recent works and it's only the average compound that looks orthorhombic. So it could be that at a local scale, you have these components. Maybe you, maybe you have them because you do have several pneumatic components that compete with each other. I don't know, this is an open question, but I think it's, it's interesting uh, to pursue. And we should think more about how to, how to use this to uh, understand the material or rule out this uh, scenario. Okay, um, what is the consequences for missing wide pocket on the spin fluctuations? Well, if you just do the RPA calculation with this new band structure of our Fermi structure with no wide pocket, you get the wrong signal. You cannot explain the pension dyes, highly anisotropic uh, spin fluctuations, um, and actually the dominant scattering is still pi pi, and there's hardly any symmetry. Uh, actually, this this uh, one is a little larger. It's supposed to be this one. So you can solve this, or you can you can cure this problem by including uh, quasi-particle weight factors. This is something we have discussed a lot previously. Now you can also probably cure this. This is something that was discussed briefly with Emil Yermin. You can probably also discuss this by some general background of, of inelastic scattering. I mean, the reason you get such strong pi pi scattering, even though there's nothing pi pi, I mean, you would think that you would get a long, large peak in the spin system just from, from, from this vector here. But it's not the case in these systems where there's large contribution from higher energy processes. But if they are washed away by some self energy effects, you might get back to a picture where this is strongly uh, enhanced. Of course, in reality, you will have momentum and energy dependent self energy effects. So all the physics will be in there. There will be some, uh, what's your quote, orbital selectiveness, and there will be also uh, general effects of, of weakening from, from general inelastic processes. In terms of the superconductivity, things have changed a bit. Like all that matters, if there really is no wide pocket, is the Fermi surface itself. And whether you do a, a, a plain vanilla spin fluctuation calculation just with this band structure, or whether one includes suppressed uh, quasi pilot breaks in the XY channel or splitting because of pneumaticity in the X and Y set, but these effects should be then the real material, calculate them, they are there. But whether you include them or not in the calculation of superconductivity is relevant. This is something that was also pointed out in this paper here. <clears throat> Okay, so um, that concludes my story of iron selenium for now. I will just in the last few minutes, I hope I have two few more minutes, nobody's complaining too much. Uh, I will take, uh, I will show you a scenario where, where orbital selectivity or band or orbital dependence is very strong on superconductivity and it's opposite of one what, what might expect. And I think this is interesting because it relates to the general questions of whether interactions are friend or foe of superconductivity. Typically we would say you need interactions to generate unconventional superconductivity and the more you have, the better, unless you start going into a mod machine or so on. But in this metallic systems, where we have multi-orbitals that are relevant for Fermi surface, there's another question, which is, you know, if you have this, this kind of ion-based systems, where will the superconducting gap action be largest? And I'm not talking about Fermi surface effect, or Fermi velocity effects at density of states and so on, but just in terms of interactions. Will the superconducting gap be largest or smallest in the most correlated orbital? You know, naively one might say it should be largest on the most correlated orbital because that has largest U of J. However, that turns out not to always be true. And so 
that's a very complicated question. And, you know, this is the heart of a lot of research these days, trying to capture in some unbiased way the origin of superactivity and correlated in multi-orbital systems is not uh, a solved problem. But what we can do is that we can run the flex. So flex is, is, is a way to do, so because to answer that question, we have to do some self-consistent calculation. We can't put in self-energy effects by hand. And then we get what we put in, in a sense. And so we have to do some self-consistent calculation. So I won't explain flex, but it's an, it's an old technique. You're running, basically finding the, uh, the, the, the correlated Green's function in terms of certain number of diagrams. And it's the same diagrams that enter into the self-energy and into the, into the spin susceptibility. And therefore, you can feed that also into the pair encoding in the end of the calculation. So we do that. Again, we find pocket shrinking. This is the same as this, basically the same as this attention mechanism. The Fermi surfaces change a little bit. But the main part of this whole exercise, and this is the main part of this paper we, we wrote here, is, is that as your bare Fermi surface, you will have a large, you might have such a scenario here. This is, this is typically what you have. Now, I'm, by, by the way, talking using life as an example because it's simpler. I don't have to worry about limiticity and so on. Um, and so in, in often what happens is that the, the X, Y orbital is the dominating one, largest Fermi surfaces or largest density of states. We have the largest peak at pi zero. This is just one intraorbital component. It's calculated by Andreas Kreisel. And you see that the X, Y orbital is large. This was, in fact, the original problem of Ion's selenite, getting the gap structure right to get rid of this and to invoke very strong quasi particle weight reductions to get rid of this. Now, what happens if you run the flex? It's quite uh, striking. They are, they are inverted. So now, in the, in the new renormalized susceptibility, it's actually the uh, uh, X in this particular uh, direction, it's the X set susceptibility that peaks over the X, Y. The reason for that is it's the same virtual processes that enter into, the, into uh, these, uh, uh, the susceptibility and self-energy. There's a large susceptibility and a large self-energy. So you have to find the balance, right? So the self-energy will smear out this blue peak, it'll lower it. And the question is, how low does it go? And it can actually be such that it's inverted. And this is exactly the picture that one gets in the sort of poor man's version, trying to include self-energy effects into productivity by, by incorporating quasi particle weight factors. Um, so in fact, if we just, uh, if we just, so we could be putting in this generated uh, pairing kernel into the realized gap equation. This is what uh, Andreas did. And then he plots the gap. This is when, and here the Fermi surface looks like this. Whole pockets are here, and whole pockets are here, and then two large electron pockets. It's an SY uh, supernatural gap structure. There's a sign change between the whole and the electron pockets. But what you see if you run the flex is that the XY contribution is substantially decreased. So everything that was XY on the Fermi surface, that's in the tips of these pockets, and this whole pocket is fully XY. Here, the gap is basically washed away. Okay. And exactly the same you get if you calculate the quasi-particle weight factors and just put them in, sort of in a poor man's version at the RPA level, you get almost exactly the same gap structure. So uh, this is a nice example, in my opinion, of you know, how, how do these sort of orbital dependent interactions affect uh, superconductivity. And uh, it's an example of most correlated orbitals uh, being, being harmful to superconductivity, which was in this picture of, of of orbital selectivity, large or small set factor means small gap. You just put them in. Here's, here's an example of how that comes about. Of course, it will be, be very, very nice, and in future studies will for sure uh, correct some of the problems that is in this flex approach. And, and hopefully, or maybe we'll see that, that this holds true for more uh, rigorous methods. Okay. I am uh, at the uh, conclusion slide. So um, I have shown you just briefly how longer range full number repulsion naturally can lead to these red blue shifts, small pockets. There's an interesting 
uh, intraorbital large pneumaticity component that is sort of microscopically generated also from the same mechanism. It might be the explanation of the no Y pocket in ion solenoid. And then I showed you an example of a self consistent calculation with uh, susceptibility, self energies, and pairing where there was this orbital inversion which, uh, which strongly affects the gaps. And uh, you know, this is a, if this is holds true, I think this is a very uh, important mechanism to keep in mind when we're trying to explain gap details, when we're trying to, you know, we get an office experiment and we see gap uh, wobbling around certain hole and electron pockets, and um, that might not just come straight out of a, a, a bare calculation. If one has to include such self energy effects, they might, and they might even be an explanation for some of these uh, uh, strong and isotropies around pockets. Okay, I think that's it. I will uh, stop here. Thanks a lot, Brent. Yeah, it's a very interesting talk. Yeah, okay, so uh, I, I'll try to ask you a question first. So, so which orbital then do you believe it's more important for superconductivity? I mean, you said XY may not be so important, right? But what, what, is, uh, what, what is between uh, YZ and XZ? Do you have a feeling uh, which one? Which, which material are we now? Oh, uh, yeah, this, 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 I mean, this general, you know, just in general, right? I mean, yeah. Oh, general. Um, well, it's hard to say. I, I mean, if you take a general multi-orbital system, mm -hmm. still you need interactions to get unconventional superconductivity, right? But what is shown here is that the that there can be cases where what what you might think is is should be the strongest or what is the strongest correlated uh, orbital you might guess maybe would have the largest gap, but that is not the case. There is some complicated compromise. I so see. I don't know. You know, this depends on how big this effect is. You know, how, what, about, how... what about for iron selenide? Well, for iron selenide, the, the it's the a DYD, large... right? Yeah. Yeah, the y, it's a Y similar. Yeah. But what about the cobalt uh, open one to two? Uh, don't know. Okay. A any other questions? Oh, okay, Ilya. Hey, Brian, thanks very much for the nice talk. I have a question on the following issue. So I understand that, um, you know, if I start in a single band model and I include the longer range Coulomb repulsion, usually my understanding is that it tends to suppress spin fluctuation. Okay. So now, of course, in the multi-orbital case, the situation is much more complicated. And, um, but now I understand in the scenario for the iron uh, selenium, um, you need a sizable, um, interorbital pneumaticity induced by this longer range Coulomb. So it essentially needs to be one of the significant interactions. Now, if you go to the, um, uh, so the, the question is, did you compute the spin susceptibility by including also the, uh, the next nearest neighbor Coulomb repulsion? Because I understood you discussed the effect of the Fermi surface topology change on the spin susceptibility, but do you know what would be if you now also include this uh, longer range Coulomb in this RPA loop, let's say, and see whether it will suppress spin fluctuation or not. Because, you know, experimentally, we know that in iron selenium, in the pneumatic phase, the spin fluctuation are there. Yeah, yeah. No, um, so good question. No, we didn't do that. We, we could do it actually uh, include, I mean, you. this is this is just a, a standard calculation for where longer range Coulomb was not included specifically in, in the, in, and that was your main question, yeah. Um, you're right that uh, generally um, nearest neighbor Coulomb will, will boost uh, charge susceptibilities and then there will be some kind of competition between those two. Um, yeah, but then, but then it just boils down to a matter of parameters, how big is U compared to V and, and so on. So yeah, we, we, could, we could look into that, but we didn't. Any other question? Maybe, maybe I, since nobody else is asking, can, can I ask a question, Pinche? Yeah, yeah, please. Just, just sort of step back, Brian, just to take advantage of this setting and ask your opinion. So, so FESE, the pneumaticity, in many ways, is different from um, uh, one, two, two uh, nectites and 
FETE is different, et cetera. So there's a lot of variation across different materials. Um, do you think that combining this nearest neighbor coulomb repulsion or just longer range uh, uh, density density interactions along with the uh, outside uh, U, Holmes, et cetera, uh, do, do you feel the prospect of getting overall picture of the variations uh, across the materials as far as pneumaticity is concerned? Or do you think that it's still early stage that we need more information? Yeah, difficult question. I am, it, it's an interesting thing to, I, I, I don't know, but um, I was surprised of, you know, we don't know that much about pneumaticity in some of the other materials, right? Because magnetism sets in, uh, I mean, it's just purely experimental. Mm -hmm. We want to access a low temperature property in these spaces. Um, I mean, there are some recent developments, uh, forget the exact references now, of, of this momentum dependent uh, uh, pneumaticity also in some of the other materials. Mm -hmm. And so, so certainly the original picture that many of us used of just some barrel orbital splitting turned out to be way too, too simplistic. Um, I don't know if, if, if nearest neighbor Coulomb is the answer to, to all this. Uh, I doubt it because uh, you know there's plenty of, 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 of other ways to generate pneumaticity in these systems. Uh, I just find it striking how, uh, how simple it is to get the right bands of ion selenide using this mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we're not the first to point this out. This was pointed out by others already, but we revisited it and, and, and uh, found some interesting things in terms of this uh, interorbital pneumaticity. Great, fair enough. I mean, there, there could be other mechanism underlying, but uh, cooling interaction, the, uh, further neighbor interactions or, or longer range interaction would be part of the story in affecting the uh, underlying electronic structure, I suppose. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if, I, if I may, um, I, I think that um, it's not just an added uh, element because it's really uh, something which is known um, even in realistic simulations is the main thing which is left out. So in, in practice, uh, we, we uh, with Brian we have done very similar things. Okay, we, we our use of hybrid functionals is basically integrating in the DFT exactly the short range uh, FOC uh, exchange. Uh, so it's nearest neighbor. Uh, it's the first. Uh, it's not really long range. I mean, in in this sense, is the is the is the first. Um, contribution beyond the local interaction. And that is known to be needed to correct the self uh, interaction uh, error of DFT. So it's naturally the, 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 the thing you wanna add on top of a realistic uh, Hamiltonian coming from, from DFT. So in this sense, I think it's, uh, it's a mechanism that simply by, by, by the fact that it's one very important missing piece to any realistic band structure, um, it's probably the first thing that should act uh, to induce uh, the, the, the shrinking or the pneumaticity. So I think there's good chances that this is one of the main pieces missing. I mean, I think it's fair. It's just a question, are we at the stage uh, after 10 years, are we at the stage of getting overall understanding of, of the variations of pneumaticity vis-a-vis -vis magnetism and other things? Uh, across Maybe. these different materials. And, and I think, you know, it seems like an interesting ingredient. Uh, I don't know in the end whether it's going to be playing an important role or not. Then certainly mm -hmm. it would be good to explore. Okay. Yes. Okay, if there's uh, no, no more questions, uh, let's, uh, let's thank uh, Brian and Luca again. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you, you both. Yeah, thank you, Thanks. thank you. Very, very, thank you very, very much for, 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 for giving these talks. It's a 